could tell you about the percentage of the budget. Uh, <laughs> get a couple things out of the way for it. I could tell you that uh, I, I'll just start through. Uh, and I'll just do the first part that doesn't take a whole bunch here, and then we'll see where we're so at. You might here. want to go make a couple. Um, as you know, um, by state law, we're required to have a balanced budget, and I want to make sure I mention always the balance balanced budget means that it can include the fund balance that we have. It doesn't mean that your revenues have to exceed your expenditures. You just have to have the money that you can allocate uh, to have a balanced budget, and you must do it before July 1st of uh, every year. Uh, the difficult part in that always is the state doesn't have to have their budget done by that time, so this year will be an example of that, that they'll be working towards October 1st, and as we get in here a little bit further, um, I'll mention that to you, that, um, that October 1st date, we're just not sure if they're going to make it at that point or not. But uh, we'll have some good estimates. Uh, they've usually come in, even if it's the last minute. I think, Mike, you and I remembered one time they went a couple days past. Um, but that's technically when their first state aid payment has to come in is in the month of October. So that will put more pressure on them. Um, a couple of things. I'll just talk about the timeline a little bit, where we were. Um, we set our budget workshop in April. And then we followed up here at this meeting uh, with the actual budget for 1920. And I want to remind everybody, we have a second meeting in June always, and there's a couple reasons. That allows us to, um, on the back side, you get to finally approve 1920, but you also get to approve the final 1819 budget. Remember, budgets have to be, they're not really advisory in nature. They really just reflect where's our income coming from and how are we spending it. So we do adjustments. So when we started 1819 last June, uh, we got to March and made an adjustment and we make another adjustment in June. So actually when I'm developing this budget, I don't quite know exactly where we finished 1819. And we're good enough to have a pretty nice variance at the end, so it makes it a little more difficult. We predict pretty well, but the variance is, is that money they give back at the very end that, that maybe people are holding back a little bit thinking they might have one more thing come in. So, so that, that will be coming up uh, at that uh, June 24th budget. Um, I guess I'll mention while we're at it, as long as I'm at that line, uh, one of the parts of the budget is to establish the uh, millage rates. Um, so I would at least uh, tell you in general that the millage rates, um, starting with the non-homestead, which was voted on, I think it's back in 2014 now, is 18 mills. That hasn't changed. Uh, still 18 mills. Um, the other two are um, ones that get determined on an annual basis. One is what we refer to as the hold harmless millage. That's because when Prop A came in, we were funded greater than that. It allows us to collect $415.31 per pupil. So there's two things the state al allows me to do when I determine that rate. I have to use their formula sheets to start with. So there's not anything the district made up. It's us providing the input into their uh, spreadsheet, if you will. And what that involves is how many students do you think you're going to have and what your taxable values look like. So you take those two things into account and that establishes the rate that you can levy for that millage. But each year you have the ability to compensate for what happened the year before because it is possible, if you remember, I'm giving you estimates on how much students and the taxable value can grow during the course of a year. So every year the state allows you to come back in and when you come back in, they let you adjust. If you over-collected uh, back in 17-18, they would make you collect less this year. If you under-collected, they would let you collect more. So that rate's going to get established at 1.8090 mills. Um, that's up from last year for the very reason is we under-collected. If you remember, um, we had uh, pretty good return on our students. They, we were underestimating. We had more students, and the tax value did increase during the year. So we're allowed to collect a little more. So it's up 0.1276 mills. Um, one of the things you're going to be talking about after this is the summer tax collection for the city. The city will split that in half. So you'll see them do 0 0.9045 in their summer tax collection in the same and know that anybody other than the city, they collect one, so they'll lobby that whole 1.8090. Um, the actual bond debt millage that you passed 
in 2015. Um, we get that millage rate based on what we have left to pay and what we're able to take in on our tax of value and our financial advisor on the bond, PFM is the company's name, will tell us what we should levy. Now, even though you have two series, they look at the two series and put them together, so I have one number for you, and that will be 2.95 mils. That's up slightly, but that's to be expected as you go. Um, that's, no, it's, it's the uh, same as what it was set at originally, but as you do the two series, typically you're paying off one, and when the new one comes on, it jumps a little bit, and so then you have the two bonds working together. So we'll be back at 295, and next year you'll do the same thing and bring it back again. Okay? I think, Bob, you're going to be operating off yours and just go into it. Okay. Let me do this then. Stop doing anything. So maybe I can't work off mine. Hang on here. Cindy has the paper one. I got paper cut for that. I was just seeing if I could bring it back up. All right. All right. We're due from paper copy. Um, budgets take both the revenue and the um, expenditures. Those are the two things we have to do. And so what we, when we build the budget, we always start with our assumptions. So if I start with the revenue, I usually start with the state. There's two major areas. One would be the state aid foundation per pupil, and the other would be categorical aid. So the state aid foundation is we're really trying to determine is there is there not an increase in how much the state's going to give us. Well, it's a big unknown, as we said before, but we're going to do our best estimate. Up until the middle of last week, we had two estimates, one from the governor and one from the Senate. Uh, they both used, I shouldn't say that, one used a 2x formula, one used a 1.5 formula, and they estimated anywhere between $120 per student increase for Midland. We're always on the low end of that. We're like that half x formula. And someone else would get 240 and the Senate was 135 so someone else would get 270 The House came out at 90 and 180 but that was late last week. So as I've given you your packet ahead of time, too, uh, I'm estimating that we'll be at $100 per pupil, so that's going to be our assumption. Um, I would caution you in two things as I was going to say as we look at it, but as you hear me talk here, there are two major factors as we go through. And those two factors are how much are they going to give us per pupil and how many pupils do we have. And both those are things that we have to estimate. And I would tell you I would do that conservatively. So I've looked at this and um, I got another slide that's coming up on how many students so I'll talk about that in a minute. But even when I say 100, if you get $20 more students, you know, that's one swing. If it comes in less than 100, that's another. At the same time, if I have 10 more students than I predict, it's another. So when you talk estimating, you really have to look at both numbers. And I think what we tried to do is make assumptions that cover us in a conservative fashion as long as things follow kind of the status quo. On the categorical aid, um, we do know that the 147 money in these categories go to different things, but this deals with retirement system, and anyone that's been on the board long enough knows that the state retirement costs can, or, or was, eating up our budgets dramatically. And what I would tell you is um, the 147A and C, and you don't have to know all the letters, but, but one is the cost, uh, cost offset, the other one is the rate cap. Um, those are both uh, assuming to be there. It does fluctuate based on their assumptions on who will be in our employ next year because it's going to fluctuate how much money they give you based on the retirement that they're generating. So that does fluctuate, so we know, or at least we're predicting, that's going to be down somewhat. Um, we also know that retirement in general, so when you're looking at retirement in general, that um, our rates are going to be up about 1.4. Now, the way that is is because that cap that they give you floats just a little bit, and it's going to float about 2.2% uh, for us. And then even our mix of employees make a difference. There must be 8 to 14 different employment plans. So as the people that are on the basic, that sounds bad, but that's the oldest formula there was, and then there's MIP, those are going away, and we're taking on more employees on the newest part of the retirement. Uh, plan And so our mix, how much do we have to contribute to retirement on average is creeping slightly up just because we're putting more into the new system than we did the old. So if I put those two together, we're projecting the retirement rates uh, cost in the district about an additional 1.4.
We're still looking at maintaining the 31A at-risk funding that we've had. We don't see that as an increase, even though in the governor's proposal was there. It has not showed up that way in either the House or the Senate. Um, some of the grants, and I won't run through everything, but what we tried to do is look at the grants in the three proposals and see if there are any that seem to be missing, not going to be there, or if there were any that we thought we should keep in. So for example, um, the safety grant that Brian got last year, um, it's not going to be there. So that's a chunk of money that was in our revenues that's not going to be there. Um, there was another 147E money, uh, which doesn't appear that it's going to be there, but we don't know. And there's, uh, I guess, a common one you might remember is the high school per pupil. They were giving us $25 per high school pupil. That's been out of everyone's plan but the governor. So that looks like it might go in. So we did remove those from the budget that I've put together here. Uh, the other thing I should remind you, most grants, not all, have a corresponding expenditure that goes with it. So even if we get some of those grants, then I'm going to increase expenditures because they have to go to particular items when they come in. So that's something you have to work with. Um, I was uh, going to make a reference to a chart, but let's just talk per pupil foundation allowances just a little bit here. Um, if we come in at the $8,631 that I'm projecting, I just wanted to give a reference to people. While that's an increase, I'd want you to know back in, I guess I'll call it our heyday, 2008 and 2009, um, $8,904 a kid. And we're just getting back, if we get the 100 to 8631 And, of course, lots of costs have changed in that time. But it's just to show you where we're at. Uh, Midland has be a district where, because of our taxable value, we do contribute a bigger percentage locally. Uh, state makes up the difference. You can look at other districts where the state's providing the bigger chunk of money because those districts do not have the ability or the taxable value that needs to be there. Uh, other major revenue assumptions you need to do so when you see some numbers, it uh, doesn't look quite the same. Remember, we also got a big STEM gift grant last year, 1.2 or 3. 1.25, um, that won't be in there, so that's going to take the revenues down immediately. We also had a WE diversity grant, which was about 50000 and those both were fully received in 1819. Uh, the uh, countywide enhancement millage is going to be down about 6%. There's a little difference in how that gets distributed. Uh, the ESA can have a portion of that, and some of the charters, if they're Midland County students, so they're telling us to kind of project uh, that being down. Some of our special ed reimbursements and Medicaid reimbursements that, that deal with special education due to not providing those services or not being able to bill those services, and that will fluctuate from year to year. Looks like that number will be down. Um, again, that's just because we're not billing or not having those services. Uh, and then finally, I want to talk about the enrollment. Um, we do go with a consultant, you know that. And then we look at also what we know about the district. And so to be conservative, I'm projecting enrollment to be down by 30 students. Um, that would take us to a blended count of 7,651. I think that's conservative. Uh, if you uh, have in your packet, I know, uh, any of the enrollment charts or the blends that you see, uh, one of the biggest factors for our budgets kind of stabilizing and not being so dramatic year to year has been the student enrollment. And you'll see a leveling of the student enrollment as it goes through. And again, I want you to think in terms of um, you know, if those 30 students we don't lose and come in at where we are, you know, that's a swing of um, about 250,000. Um, if we don't get 100 and we only get 70, that's about 250. So right there, that would cover it. And that's one of the things we try to do is look at all those and kind of play them off each other so that we come up with what we think is a pretty good estimate of where we're going to be. I'm not telling you we've never been surprised, but we've been doing pretty good at, at beating that enrollment. Um, and uh, we've been pretty good at predicting where that money is going to come in at. Uh, like I said, you would see if, when the chart, and you guys have that chart in the budget narrative I gave you, but a real uh, leveling off of the enrollment trends as we go. And in fact, um, some of that enrollment bubble as it was decreasing, I had another chart in there that will show you that um, we kind of expected at one time that all the losses we had seen in elementary were going to continue to the high school. They haven't, and in some ways, the elementary is really stabilized on top of that. And that's, that's really what's happened is um, the kids that you were losing and saying, boy, the grades are getting this much smaller in K1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that didn't necessarily hold true in 6, 7, 8, 9, and up. Did they lose students? They did. 
but not at the rate that they were. And the elementary has really kind of stabilized itself for, for lots of reasons. Um, general fund then, let me just uh, give you a real quick here so you have the numbers, but the general fund revenues, um, what we're projecting for the budget 1920 is 81,212,554. Um, the vast majority of that, 65.7% comes from the state, about 25.6% comes from our local tax, and then of course we have federal and we have that enhancement millage which is a transfer and we have some other local revenue. Um, actually, our local property tax, that little piece of the pot, is bigger than you would see in most um, uh, districts if they're doing that. You'd see a much bigger slice from the state. But again, that's our tax base. But uh, $81,212,554. On the expenditure side, again, we have to make some assumptions there. Um, we did do what we've commonly referred to our balance, our budget process. Wanted you to know that we continued that this year. Uh, we meet with all the buildings and departments and have them project to us their expenditures and what they need to do. Uh, we had or did try really hard to keep those spendings at eight, at the 18, 19 levels that they were at. Now, sometimes there's fluctuations in that a little bit, but that's what we tried to do. Um, I guess the one thing I'd want to tell you about <clears throat> that, and if I had to show that to you, but the biggie is that that kind of expenditure only makes up 14% of our budget or 15% at best. The vast majority of our expenditures are on personnel, 85 to 86% of that, depending on where we are and what our makeup of employees are. So when we do that, there's, there's not a lot of money hidden in that part of it. I wouldn't want you to, to think that part. We do know, and you know this too, because we've just done the salary letter, we're looking at 2 to 3% salary increases and steps. Don't forget, uh, there was a time there when our employees were making concessions and they were not stepping. Uh, which means they could move either up based on experience as they go or evaluation depending on what employee group you're in. They also could move across, which means they could shift, be, say they got their master's degree to bachelor's. And that's back working again, so that's also a cost that's in there. Uh, for medical and vision, we have to make a projection because we don't get those numbers until September. Um, we know what they'll be for the first half of the year, we just don't know what the second half is. And we're projecting 5%. Uh, the 5% kind of protects us because it's only half a year, so even if it went to 10, we'd be in pretty good shape. Uh, we've had some pretty good numbers, but, um, you know, it, that can't hold off forever, so we'd rather be a little safe there. We do know dental's up 6.5%. Um, uh, the other things that we're making assumptions on, uh, we've already mentioned, our HSA contributions. I did want to mention to you it's going to be a little bit of an increase in expenditures for the HSAs this year coming up because if we do two-thirds in January, I'm doing half for July, right, and then another two-thirds. So within a, a budget year, I'm going to have slightly more than what would be a full year. It's going to even itself up after year, but that caused that to be slightly higher. Our federal allocations, now we're getting into some of the grant stuff, but you've heard us talk about Title I, Title IIA, Title I-D. Um, they're all allocated at basically 85% of what they were. The, fe the feds have tightened up their money there. And the other part of that is this budget does not include any carryover money because, A, we're not quite sure where that is, and we usually adjust for that at, at, uh, at, a, at adjustment time. And the other part would be is we're not going to have as much carryover. Um, we had quite a bit here, and we've spent most of that carryover, so those federal grant dollars are going to be down. Uh, that the same would be... For 31A, while we're going to get that amount, we won't have the carryover that we did after that first year. That always fluctuates depending on what expenditures you had and what was left there. Um, could be less and less carryover if they keep funding us at 85% of what we had the year before. Uh, that causes things to happen that, that we don't really control. I do always, too, mention to everybody, we always look at our staffing patterns. I think that's the other thing that's been something that we've done. We really try to analyze vacancies, replacements, do we need additional, do we need to reduce? I think that's important we do. And I think sometimes, and I just wanted to say this, but that additional salary always comes with more than just that salary. People will often say to me, well, that, you know, that'll cost you a starting teacher's salary. They'll say that's, I don't care, 40,000. And I just want people to realize that with that comes at least 50% of that in state retirement and FICA. And that's not the other benefits that come in there. So it's, it's often that, you know, if we took, uh, I think the average teaching salary now is in the $70,000, but say 70000 
There's going to be another 35 on top of that before we talk about the cost of benefits. Not complaining about that, but it's just important to know that's why we try to watch our staffing levels. We, we need to make sure they're important and that we can continue to provide them. That's the other thing. A lot of people look at staffing in the one-year term. Well, that's going to grow. So we always have to look at it and say, can we support this or are we creating something that's unsupportable as we go forward? So something that we try to do. That's one of our major expenditures. So you have a chart that you'll be able to see. And again, uh, you have copies. This will go on the web, at least the PowerPoint, not the presentation, but you'll be able to see the, um, the PowerPoint itself. You can see the expenditures. Um, the chart that I have is a comparison between um, our budget we're proposing for 1920 and what we had in March of our 1819 budget. Um, tough to compare because I want you to remember a couple things. Typically, March has every grant that we're ever going to get in there and everything that's there, and the starting budget typically does not have that. You would notice a couple things. Expenditures are actually down. They're just not down as much as the revenues. Okay, so you put those two together, that's going to kind of get to our final line here. On the expenditure side, then, we uh, are looking at an expenditure of $83,117,259. And again, if you're just doing quick math in your head, you realize that at least in the beginning part that we will have to dip into fund balance for part of that difference because there is a difference. Before I leave expenditures, I would tell you again that the pie chart that you typically will see, it is 85 to 86% in personnel costs. And the other things that are out there, like the purchase services you do, the contracted services, supplies, capital outlays, uh, much smaller portion of that that part of the budget. And even if you look at it in terms of we've worked very hard uh, with that general fund expenditures, if you look at the amount of money that goes towards uh, classroom instruction, student support, instructional support, we still try to keep a lot of our money in those areas. So you'll see that when you look at it, I think roughly about 77% of it. Um, the others, about 12.4, administration of any kind, building any place, about seven. And, Business and HR are the things you need to keep a business running, about 3.5. So when we get to the general fund snapshot, um, I guess I'd point out to you again, um, we're looking at budget of revenues for the 1920 budget of $81,212,554 and the budget expenditures of $83,117,259. That is a difference, and it's uh, we'll have to dip into fund balance then for $1,904,705. So um, that's about $1.9 million. I mentioned a couple things to you. We always have had a variance. So when you get a chance to look at that in your packet, mm -hmm. um, the only thing I've changed there is I've typically been very, very conservative and projected it at 1%. I did project this one at 1.5 because in all honesty, in the last 10 years, it's been between 2 and 3 so I think 1.5 is still a pretty good comparison. That would generate an additional uh, 1.2, almost 1.3 million. So the anticipated shortfall would be about 657,000. I want to mention a couple of things on that if I could. Um, one is you are purposely going in the fund balance for at least a couple of things. So when you look at that amount after the variance, the 657,947, out of there, um, you are scheduled to spend out of your fund balance 205000 from your STEM grant. Don't ever forget, you put the money in there for a reason, and that's one of the reasons. So that's there. Um, you're also going into your technology. Remember, we siloed some things, assigned versus unassigned. What is technology? And if you remember, we've been switching over the middle schools to Chromebooks as the new sixth graders come in, so they get to keep using the same computers they had in elementary school. And so we're due to do another one of those, and that's typically somewhere in the $180,000 range. At least that's what we earmarked. And there's a little bit of IB money, not very much, in the diploma program that would run itself out. So if I put those together in a purposeful way, what you put the fund balance together for, for some of those assigned restricted things, you're going to take out about $410,000 out of that $600,000. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention, and I would show you, and I showed you at the budget workshop, um, I don't want you to think of it as, as a deficit budget. Your fund balance allows you to start the yes. year uh, with a balanced budget. Um, I gave you historically 10-year run of what 
you had done previously. We've only, as, as late as 2015-16, if you want to call it an adoption where the expenditures exceeded the revenue, that you were still doing that. Now, by the time we get the variance and come in at the end, the last three or four years, we've been able to put money in that fund balance, which you need to do um, because that builds it. But that's not meant to be doing that all the time. In actuality, um, I ran a couple of things on this one just to see where we would be. If the average revenue percent of what we end up at the end audited and the average expenditures come in, you'll have a balanced budget. You will not actually touch your fund balance. If you get the extremes, you can think of that two different ways, right? Worst I've ever seen the revenues come in compared to what you started with, and the worst I've seen the expenditures come in, then you could be closer to losing that uh, 650 or taking that out of fund balance um, up to you know the full 1.9 uh, if you had no uh, change there. But I would tell you that the um, that's really not what the averages would tell us would happen on that one. In no matter which case you look at, um, I looked at the variance to cover it all would take about 2.3, and we're looking. That would be right in the wheelhouse of where you've been. And like I said, um, our job's not to, our job's to put a fund balance together that's healthy, allows you to do lots of things, but it's not to become just a continual bank of things you do. And that's one of the steps you've taken to budget. Uh, the other part I looked at was, so you would have an idea, you see lots of different fund balances. People are going to give you lots of different percentages. There's just how much is in the fund balance. Then there's what we call the restricted and the unrestricted. And then restricted is gifts that can't be spent for anything else. We've been trending, and those numbers are, are, are higher. And you'll see those in some of the charts you have in there. The other number they had for you, just so you would know, is what we're now calling the unassigned fund balance. Because not only do we have those gifts that are there and inventory we've paid for, a uh, little bit of workman's caps we serve, but we've been uh, siloing money for copiers and technology because the bond doesn't last forever in those areas. And they're both going to come up down the road someplace. So we're trying to set the money aside so when we get there, it's not such a hit to the general fund. It's already been saved and sitting there. And when we look at that part, um, we would be looking at about at the end of next year, if all that variance comes true, 18.7% in that unassigned, which is still a very healthy place to be. If you just talk about total fund <coughs> balance, you're going to be 22 23%. Depends on where we end this year, to be honest with you. As do all these numbers, because don't forget, every time we do this, I'm giving you one fund balance, and I will do that next uh, board meeting on the 18 19 numbers, but it's still that audit that comes in and you know what actually got expended, because we're going right up to the last day of June. Um, whether that came in, didn't come in, the auditor wants us to attribute it to this year, next year, all those points that come into being. So again, uh, this is one that uh, you still have a, a pretty uh, healthy uh, general fund balance. Um, you still <clears throat> are uh, you know, at a point where you're purposely going in to spend some of the money, but in the same token, I really do feel when I look at it that when we, when we get to the end with the variance, that this is, in essence, a balanced budget that's really tough to do. Now, with the uncertainty of the state, Mike's mentioned this a couple of times, but I think it's really important we talk about it. It's possible you're going to have to do an extra adjustment next year. I mean, if you know in October or November, hey, the, the student count was way wrong and the state gave us more or less, you might decide, um, Brian might decide, and Lauren might decide they want to do an adjustment earlier because when that's unknown, you know, that's a bigger number. Now, don't remember, we won't know numbers until we hit the October count day. So that's why October it, might be a it tough It would be one. my recommendation we do with not getting a state budget until late fall. So. Yes. And so at that point, that's the budget where we're at. And again, um, I, I get one last chance, I guess, to, to thank the people. It is a uh, major undertaking to put a budget together. Um, and so I can't, I got to thank Lori Holderby in the business office. They, they do the hardest part of the work. I get to talk to you about it. And they put in a lot of time. And then it takes every department on an $81 million revenue or an 81, $83 million expenditures. Um, takes a lot of people out there to, to analyze how they want to spend their numbers. Um, you know, my job is to question them always to make sure it's something we really need. Um, but in essence, without the departments, the building principals, 
um, all the financial people that help us out there, um, all those people thinking about those things. It's hard to put a budget together for you, but I didn't want you to think it was a singular effort. It never is. Like I said, Lori really pulls the bulk of the, the work she has to do, most of the heavy lifting on it. So that's the budget.